So this morning, we're going to be continuing our series in uh, talking about spiritual disciplines. And so this morning, I I want to talk a little bit about this story in the Gospel of John. That was, that was, uh, you were like a ninja, Keelan, you were like a ninja there. (laughs) I want want to talk about the story that's in the book of John. And um, uh, John tells this story where Jesus is engaged in some pretty tough teaching. And uh, he, he's, he's talking about, he starts off by talking about something that sounds kind of nice. He starts off by talking about how, you know, he's the bread of life, right? He starts off by talking about how he is the bread of life, which seems like a nice thing. Uh, then he starts talking about them uh, needing to eat his flesh. And so he's preaching, and he's like, I'm the bread of life. And everybody's like, oh, yay, bread of life. And then he's like, so you're going to need to eat my flesh. And at that point, the crowd starts to turn on him, and people start kind of thinking this is kind of crazy. And John shares this line that's actually pretty funny. He shares this uh, line uh, where he says this. Uh, it says, many of his disciples who heard this said, this message is harsh who can hear it? This message is harsh. Who can hear it? And when I read that, I started chuckling because, like, do you remember? Uh, do you remember slang in like the Clueless movie era? You know. And so all I could hear in my head was like harsh much, and I and I was like, like I could just picture all of these people. They're like, this is harsh. You know. Anyways, I just saw this like all the clueless people listening to Jesus talk. But anyways, uh, but then Jesus starts hinting at. Uh, he starts hinting that following him is actually going to get really difficult. They're not just are they going to have to eat his flesh where he's actually sort of foreshadowing uh, communion and, and the Lord's Supper. But he starts talking about how it's going to get really hard to follow him and many of the disciples leave. Many of the disciples, uh, just the people who've been following in the crowds, they, they leave. They're like, this is too much for us. We can't do this. And so Jesus turns to the 12 disciples that we're familiar with and he asks them if they're going to leave as well. And Peter responds like this. Peter says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are God's holy one. Now, this passage is one of my favorite verses in the scripture. It's uh, become uh, sort of one of my kind of life verses. Uh, I understand what Peter's Peter's saying here. Like, Lord, where are we going to go? Where else else are we going to go? You're the only one who has the words of of life, and, and, and I understand that, I feel that, I get that. And I was kind of thinking about this idea. The truth is at Vox, we believe the same thing as Peter as well. We believe that Jesus has the words of eternal life, not just, not just like life after we die, not just like we get to go to heaven when we die, not just that kind of eternal life, but life now. And Jesus has these words of life now. And at Vox, one of the phrases that we use to describe what it means to be a follower of Jesus is believing that Jesus is who he said he was and that Jesus did what he said he did. And so at Vox, we believe that Jesus is actually God in the flesh, God incarnate, that God came here. We believe that when Jesus uh, referred to himself as I am and in a number of other places that he was actually claiming to be God here and now. We believe that, but we also believe that Jesus died and rose again in order to deal with the problem of our brokenness, with the problem of our sin, that something changed in the universe when Jesus was uh, crucified on the cross and when he walked out of the grave three days later, we believe that something was fundamentally different in the universe. And we believe, we believe like Peter We believe that what Jesus taught us makes sense. We believe that what Jesus taught us about how life is to be lived is is one of the only things that truly makes sense. And that that's how we live the full and rich and abundant life that Jesus promised us. Now, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I was was taught by people that I should believe in Jesus because the Bible said so, right? Right? Uh, for the Bible tells me so, right? Uh, that the idea was that since the Bible said that Jesus was the Son of God, since the Bible said that Jesus was who he said he was, then I should believe in Jesus. But as I grew up, I started struggling with that a little bit, and I started wondering if maybe we got it the wrong way around. 
I started wondering if maybe, maybe we shouldn't believe in Jesus because the Bible tells us. See, here's the thing. Uh, a few years back, uh, about 12 years ago now, I think it is, I ended up having a pretty significant crisis when it came to my faith. And I began a process that a lot of people talk about uh, called deconstruction, where I started really struggling with a lot of the things that I had been taught, a lot of the, the messages that I have been taught about faith. And I started really struggling with what I believe. And I wasn't entirely sure that I believed in any of it anymore. And I was starting to lose my faith. I was starting to lose my faith in Christianity and my faith in God and my faith in Jesus. But the problem was I couldn't shake Jesus. There's something about Jesus that just made sense to me. There's something about how Jesus taught us to live that makes sense. And not only that, there's, there's all sorts of really good arguments that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. There's, there's lots of good arguments like that, and I understand that. And we could talk about some of that stuff if you wanted to, but it was more than that. It was that when I listened to what Jesus said, when I listened to what Jesus taught, and when I then began to put that into practice in my life, it, it, it worked. It made sense. It, it, it actually began to allow me to have this rich and full and abundant life that Jesus promised. And, and when I rebelled against that, that's when things started to go wrong. And so what ended up happening is while I had sort of struggled with most of my faith and I'd kind of given everything up, I ended up back with Jesus at the center of it. And I started realizing that Jesus really was who he said he was because it's the only way it could work and, and that he actually had done what he said he did. And then something happened. Then I realized that Jesus treated the scriptures as if they were God's word. He treated the scriptures as if they had authority, that, that when the scriptures said something that we needed to obey that and learn to live out whatever it was the scriptures were were teaching us. And so what I realized is that I didn't believe in Jesus because the Bible told me so. I believed in the Bible because Jesus told me so. And so this week we're going to talk about one of the most important, one of the most foundational spiritual disciplines there is, and that is reading your Bible. Now, I know I just lost a whole bunch of you. Some of you who grew up in the church, I just said, you got to read your Bible, and you already started to glaze over. Your eyes, they just started to glaze. You started to tune me out. I understand that, because I know maybe, maybe you've tried it before. Maybe you tried reading the Bible, and you found it boring. If, if you guys were actually here this morning, I would say, put your hand up if you've ever started at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and started reading your way through the Bible, and it would be interesting to see how far you got before you crashed and burned. Most people make it to Leviticus before everything falls apart because Genesis and Exodus, at least they got some fun stories. Then Leviticus and it just dies. So I understand that. And you're not alone if you find the Bible boring or you find the Bible confusing or if you just really don't ever read it. I was looking at this study and uh, it was a study of evangelical Christians, which is the highest group of people who actually read the Bible. And uh, what you ended up is 40% of evangelical Christians uh, reported reading their Bible once a month or less. So that's pretty bad. <clears throat> now, 60% of evangelical Christians reported reading their Bible once a week. But here's what happens, though. So that sounds like a really good number. 60% of Christians are reading their Bible at least once a week. But the problem is that number absolutely plummets the second that you take out reading your Bible at church on Sunday. So as soon as, because that's the once a week that people read their Bible, right? Because now most of you, we always put the scripture on the screen. And so you would say, oh yeah, once a week at least, I see it on the screen there. And the thing is, uh, here's the question. Why does reading our Bible matter so much? Why does it matter? Here's why it matters. Because if we want to follow Jesus, if that's what we call ourselves a Vox, as followers of Jesus, if we want to follow Jesus, and we have to know what Jesus said. We have to know what he taught us. We have to know how he taught us to live, what, what the commands were. But more than that, we have to know how Jesus interacted with people so that we know how he wants us to interact with people. One of the craziest things to me is that people call themselves followers of Jesus but haven't got a clue what he said, what he taught, etc. 
I was having a conversation with somebody one time. They were having a conversation about immigration policies. And they were telling me that they, had, they, they, didn't, they didn't believe that we should have like lax immigration policies, but we should have really strict immigration policies. And, and then they said, because as a Christian, and I was like, no, no, no. Like Jesus was a refugee for crying out loud. Right? And then I remember talking with somebody one time about caring for the poor. And they were like, you know what? People got to earn. People got to take care of themselves. And they were kind of going on. And they didn't like these policies where they were caring for the poor. And I'm like, Jesus said, if you don't feed the poor, you're going to burn. Like, that was one of the things Jesus said in Matthew 25. He said, the sheep and the goats. And the goats are the people who didn't care for the poor. And so what I started to realize is so many people don't actually know what Jesus taught and what Jesus said and how he expects us to live. But yet they call themselves Christians. They call themselves Christ ones. They call themselves followers of Jesus. But they don't even know what he talked about. This is why it matters. And so what we want to do today, I want to talk a little bit about this. Because Jesus and those who came after him actually believed that the scriptures were the inspired word of God. And this may come as a surprise to some people, particularly those who watch these videos to look for things to get mad at me for. Uh, we believe that at Vox. We actually believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I actually think that, that, that there is something really miraculous that the Bible still exists. And I have preached messages on it, and I'm not going to get into all of the evidence why I believe all that this morning. But at Vox, we believe that the Bible is the authoritative and inspired word of God. Just like Paul says in 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, Every scripture is inspired by God, is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. We talked about this two weeks ago. That, this, that the scriptures are useful for correcting, teaching, disciplining, and helping us to learn what it means to follow after God. This is what, what we talked about a couple weeks ago. And we believe then that the scriptures actually have authority. That when we read something in the scriptures that teaches us something about what it means to be followers of Jesus in our world today, that, that we have to abide by that. We, we actually are required to live by that. And like I said, there's tons of arguments. It's amazing that they exist. It's incredible that you've got all of these different books that are written over 1,600 years, and there's very little contradiction between them. It's, it's, it's really quite miraculous. There are so many things about that. There's things about, you know, the, the, the reasons why we can actually trust the gospel accounts. Uh, and if you're interested, there's tons of books that you can read on that, and, and you can look more into that. It is really quite remarkable. But to be honest, one of the greatest proofs for me about the miraculous nature of the scriptures, quite frankly, uh, is, is actually a verse in Psalm, 100, uh, or Psalm 34, verse 8. And it's a verse that says, Taste and see how good the Lord is. The one who takes refuge in him is truly happy. This idea, taste and see how good the Lord is. It's something that has really stuck with me over the years. Like I said about how Jesus makes sense. And the reason he makes sense is because uh, I have tasted and seen. And so in other words, it's like, look, it, give it a try. Give it a try. You, you, you go and you, you look at how Jesus taught us to live life, how Jesus explained that life should be lived, and you try it out. And you start living your life that way and see if it actually brings if things start to go better, if things start to, to actually go the way it seems like maybe they were designed to go. Because what I've noticed in my life is when I follow Jesus' teachings, things go better. It doesn't mean that life is suddenly without trouble, without difficulty. I'm not saying that. Excuse me, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when I live life the way Jesus taught me to live, it starts to work. And when I rebel against it, it doesn't work. It starts to fall apart. And it starts to, to, to get broken because that's, that's kind of what happens. And so for me, there's this taste and see that the Lord is good, that when I find these truths and scriptures and I put them into practice in my life, there's evidence that something is going on in this book that's bigger, that seems to be miraculous, that maybe it actually was inspired by the God who created life in the first place, right? So read your Bibles. I want to give you some suggestions this morning on how to do that. Now here's the other thing I'm not going to do this morning. I am not going to do a big, huge lesson on how 
to read your Bible. There's all sorts of different ways to read your Bible. There's things like inductive Bible studies. There's, there's all these kinds of things in the scriptures. I, I'm, not doing, uh, I'm not doing anything about that today. I'm not, I, I wanna kinda go into that. You need to do that for yourself. Take some responsibility uh, to do that yourself. You can go on the internet, you can search, you can find something that works for you as a technique for getting deeper into the scriptures, studying them uh, deeper. What I wanna do today is I kinda wanna I want to give us sort of like some broad suggestions on how to get started. And so the first thing I want to suggest is this. Start with Jesus. Start with Jesus. This isn't what people often do. Most people start Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Don't do that. It's a really, really bad idea. You're going to do that. You're going to crash and burn. Don't start Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Start with Jesus. Because that's the one that we've taken his name, Right? We've called ourselves Christ ones. We've called ourselves followers of Jesus. So start with getting to know what Jesus taught, how he lived his life, how he showed us to live his life, how he expects us to live our lives as well. So start there. I've talked before how the early church actually used to do this thing where they would read they would start with Matthew because they didn't have a ton of copies of the scriptures. And so a lot of the times there would only be like one copy of this for the entire uh, church. And so they'd have to share it and share bits of it, etc. Or they would memorize it and so somebody would recite it. But they would start at the book of Matthew and then read Mark and then read John, then read Luke and Acts. Because Luke and Acts are actually written by the same author and they're actually, originally they were called the History of Christian Origins, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And so start Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts. And when they got to the end of Acts, they would start over again. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts. When they got to the end of Acts, they would start over again. Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts. When they got to, no, just kidding. And, and the reason that they did that, though, the reason that they kept doing it over and over and over again was because they not only wanted to intellectually learn what Jesus was teaching, but they also begin, you begin to get a sense of who Jesus was. You begin to get a sense of how Jesus interacted with the people around him, how he interacted with people who were asking him questions, how he interacted with people that he didn't, he didn't agree with. You, you start to get a sense about the stuff that matters to Jesus. Like, like a lot of the stuff that seems to matter in evangelical Christianity, the stuff they get really, really upset about, Jesus never talked about because that stuff didn't really matter to him. He, he, it wasn't something that he was really upset about. But you want to know what he talked about a lot? He talked about money a lot and never in a good way. <laughs> he talked about how dangerous wealth can be a lot. And you start to get a sense for that. And then once you get a sense of that, you know what, you, you know what can start to happen? is then in situations in life where, where there's no scripture that talks about how we should behave. For example, in a global pandemic. How should Christians behave in a global pandemic? That question comes up all the time. And there's no passage of scripture where Jesus says, verily I say unto you, when COVID-19 hits in uh, 2019, this is how you, you know, thou must behavest. I don't know. right? There's no passage like that. But what we do understand is we understand that there's this, that Jesus is this God who gave up his own life for us. We understand that he laid his life down for those around him. We understand that God came here to serve. And we start realizing that the most Christ-like thing we can do is to live our lives thinking about the other person. And probably the least Christ-like thing we can do is like what some churches are doing and they're turning this whole thing into a giant protest and they're opening up on Sundays and they're squawking about their rights. If you've read the Gospels over and over and over again, right away you're like, that doesn't smell like Jesus. It doesn't smell like Jesus at all. In fact, it seems like the opposite of who Jesus was. Because you've got it in your soul. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke or Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, and Acts over and over. You get a sense of when things don't fit. Then the other thing you can begin to do is then after you've done this long enough, then you begin to go and read the rest of the New Testament and you go and read the Old Testament and you read it now with this understanding of who Jesus is. And so you understand the New Testament in light of what Jesus taught. And when it seems like there's a contradiction between Jesus and some of the, the writers in the New Testament or the Old Testament, you now can understand it through the teaching of Jesus. And I should say that Vox, that's how we approach the scriptures. 
That's how I teach. If, I, if there's ever seems to be any kind of contradiction, I will always take the teaching of Jesus over what I found somewhere else in the New Testament, and I realize that somehow I'm not reading this correctly because it has to line up with Jesus. And I don't interpret Jesus through the lens of the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament. And we don't do that here at Vox because, well, quite frankly, because we, we want to follow Jesus, and that's where we start and that's where we end. So, there's that too. So I have some questions for you too to get started. Here's some questions for you to get started when you're reading the scriptures. Instead of, instead of going that really like academic route to reading the Bible, which is sometimes what people do, it's what people like myself do when I'm working on messages, but when we're sitting down and we want to hear what God wants to say to us, here's some questions to get us started. First one is this, what speaks to my heart? So you open up the scriptures and you start reading. Start reading at the beginning of Matthew. What speaks to your heart? What is it that, that jumps out? What, what, what is sort of gets you thinking about what's going on? What, what encourages you uh, when you're reading it? What speaks to your heart? Another question, what new thought or idea comes to me? When you're reading the Bible, is there, is there something new that you never noticed before? What new thought or idea comes to you? Maybe it's something really, really serious and it's something that you had never, you'd never really caught, you'd never noticed uh, or maybe it's something, you know, kind of silly like today when I read that, this is harsh and my mind went to clueless. So what new thought or idea comes to you? Is there something the Holy Spirit's trying to say to you as you're reading it? And then what does the scripture move me to do? What does the scripture move me to do? What is it that this passage is actually asking me to do? Sometimes it's not. Maybe sometimes it's just this moment where you read it and you are struck with the reality that God loves you. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe you're reading a passage and there's a command, something that you are actually supposed to do, a way of living that you should actually be putting into practice in your life, and, and, or maybe something that you need to stop doing. Maybe there's something in your life and you're like, wow, I, I need to not do that because Jesus is actually teaching that that's stealing that my joy, stealing this abundant life from me. And then I have a couple more questions from uh, Rob Bell's book on the scripture. Rob Bell wrote a book called What is the Bible? I, this is a fabulous book on the Bible. It is a little more on the liberal progressive side of things, but it is, it is, uh, it's a very fresh take on how to understand the scriptures. And I think that there is uh, a ton of uh, really good information in it. And it's a really, I think, a really good way to sort of understand this crazy book that, you know, was written over 1,600 years by uh, 40 different authors from all these different walks of life. And so it's a great book. If you're interested and you want to go a little deeper, uh, download, or download it. You can uh, buy it at Amazon or wherever. But here's these questions that he asks. And this, this is where I, 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 what I mean when I say he's got a really different take on it. So one of the first questions he says is, why did people write this down? Why did people write this down? Because when you're reading the Bible, you got to think to yourself, somebody wrote this. Somebody thought, this is important enough that, that I'm going to take the time to write it down. And not now. They didn't just pop open their laptop and ticky, 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 and it was done. No, this was harder to do back in the day. The, the, it wasn't easy to get, you know, scrolls and that kind of stuff. So, and, and not everybody knew how to write. So what, why was this so important that this was written down? Start there. Think, is there something about this ancient document that, that, that I can understand why they thought this was so important? Because if it was that important to write down, then it's, it's important enough to take the time to read. Maybe think to yourself, what was going on in the world at the time it was written that was important to them? Now, this might take a little research. This might take a little bit of reading. you got to start looking into bibliographies. Or you got to email your friendly neighborhood pastor and say, hey, what books would you recommend? Or, you know, that kind of thing. So that you can understand what was going on at the time that it was written down. And, and, and why did that then inspire them to write it down? Or, or this is maybe a different way to look at it. Why did they feel the need to put words to this? Now, there's some things in the scripture. Why did they write it down? Like Genesis, Exodus, they're like historical accounts. They're, they're, they're narratives. They're saying, this is what happened. Let me tell you what happened. But, but maybe when you're in the Psalms or, or, or in some of the prophets, like what was going on in somebody's heart, in somebody's guts, that they felt the need, they, they, needed to, they needed to somehow get it out. They needed to put words to it. And does that resonate with you, right? 
Like, for example, the psalmist wrote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then later, when Jesus is on the cross, those words resonated with what he was experiencing, and Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And maybe in the middle of a pandemic, when you're struggling and you just can't figure out how to make ends meet and you just can't see your way forward, maybe those words resonate with you, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see that power of something that was written thousands of years ago and then becomes true in Jesus' life like almost a thousand years later and then 2,000 years later is still true in our lives today sometimes? There's power in that. Then ask the question, why has this story, passage, scripture, why, why has this account, why has it resonated with people for so long? Because we've kept it going, right? Somebody wrote it down all those years ago, and, and 3,000 years later, we're still reading it. Why has it resonated for so long? What is so timeless about this passage? It's a powerful question. Another question, what does this passage teach us about what it means to be alive? here in this world now? What does it mean? What does it teach us about what it means to be alive? One of the things you'll, you'll notice when you read the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts, over and over again, is this idea of life. This word life shows up over and over and over and over again. Life, really living. And one of the cool things in the book of John is that he uses two different words for life. One word that means like, uh, you know, my body is alive, heart pumping. But then he uses this other word for life that's, that's what he means when he talks about what life truly is about. So what is it about this that it teaches us? And then the last question, what does this teach us about these, who these people felt that God was at the time? Remember when we're reading the scriptures, we're, we're reading about what people felt about God, what people thought about God, what people wrote down about God and their interaction with God. And it's part of why in the scripture, this idea, this picture of God shifts a bit throughout the scriptures because it's, it's how those people were interacting with God at that time. And so what is it about that that's there? So these are just a couple questions to sort of get you started. So then I was thinking about this. So, so let's say, so you sit down and you start reading the Bible. You start with that Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts, and then maybe you start branching out into the epistles and the rest of the New Testament and then maybe the rest of the Old Testament. So what do we do with what we learn when we're reading our Bibles? So you come across a passage of scripture and, uh, and it speaks to you. I said, what, are, what is it, that those things that really speaks to your heart, that, that makes your heart kind of jump, right? So you come across a passage of scripture, maybe it's encouraging, maybe it's instructive, maybe it's uh, challenging and you're not sure you understand it, and maybe it's convicting. Maybe it actually makes you realize that there are some things in your life you need to repent of, you need to return to God, you need to change. So what do we do with it? Well, I'm going to make a kind of crazy suggestion here. You ready? Everybody hold on to something. You memorize it. Woo! Memorize it. I think I lost some of you again. Memorize it. It's not something we do very much. One of the first uh, verses of Scripture that I memorized was, ironically, uh, a passage of Scripture. It was in Psalm 119, verse 11, and it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I memorized it in the King James Version back in the day. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. By the way, that's actually why I don't recite verses very often when I preach. One of the reasons that I don't recite verses is not because I don't have scripture memorized. It's because, unfortunately, I have scripture memorized in multiple translations. And now what happens is I tend to drift in and out of different translations as I'm reciting them. And the other thing is that I preach most of the time using the Common English Bible because it's the most sort of literal Common English, it's the most normal English translation, and I have no passages of Scripture memorized in that. And so I always want to make sure that what I say is what you see on the screen. I was going to say behind me, but now I guess it's down here. Anyways, it's kind of cool. It's like it's at my feet. Anyways, uh, it's not there right now, though. But it could be there. If I said uh, Psalm 119, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart. Oh, there it is. It looks right there. That's so cool. Anyways, now we can make it go away. Make it go away. Ha <laughs> That was exciting. Anyways, now when I was a kid, when I was a kid, memory work was a huge thing. We would have memory work contests and all sorts of stuff. I remember I won uh, my first Bible that was actually my Bible uh, was a Precious Moments Bible that I won in a memory work uh, contest. 
But we don't do it very much anymore. And I think the reason we don't do it is first because it's hard. It's really boring and hard to sit down and actually memorize something. We, we don't even do this much for school anymore, right? And the other is I think because now we've all got, where's my Bible phone, right? We've all got our Bible phones and so you can search stuff and you can find it that way. But here's the reason that I think it's still a good idea to memorize some stuff. The first reason is this. These things are important. We memorize things that are important. We memorize passwords because they're important. We memorize a few uh, important phone numbers, not as many as we used to because now we can all just push speed dial on our phone. But we memorize a few important phone numbers. Maybe you, like me, maybe you have your social insurance number memorized. Like there's so many important things that we took the time to memorize. So, for example, the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Well, that's a bad example because that's not important at all. I have no idea why we memorized that. I don't even remember what that thing does. I think it might be the area under a parabola. I don't even know anymore. But for some reason, that's stuck in my head still. That's how we used to do things, right? We used to memorize things that were important. And the scriptures are important. It allows us, one of the reasons why it's so important to memorize scripture is it allows us to keep thinking about it throughout our day. If you read the scripture and something, something sticks out to you, maybe it's challenging. And you don't quite understand it. Taking the time to actually memorize a passage of scripture allows us to keep thinking about it throughout the day. The, the psalmist writes in Psalm 119 verse 97, psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. The Bible talks a lot about meditation. But, but in the scriptures, this idea of meditation isn't like um, maybe a Buddhist idea or some of those some Eastern religions where the idea is to sort of empty your mind. In the scripture, the idea of meditation is to keep turning over, to, to take a passage of scripture and to keep turning it over in your mind, to, to try to wrestle with it, to, to think about it, to understand it. And to get from a place where it's just a, a mental, cognitive sort of interaction to something where we begin to understand uh, deeper this idea of what this passage of Scripture is about. And in order to do that, we need to memorize these things. And one of the other reasons that, that when I was a kid we used to talk about this a lot is that when we memorize Scripture, it's incredible how often the Holy Spirit will use that Scripture and bring it back to mind as we go about our lives. There's a number of scriptures that, that I have memorized that, that are like that, right? That passage that I shared at the beginning of today's message. Where else are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of life. I memorized that passage of scripture. Because every now and then when I get frustrated, when I get frustrated with Jesus, when I get frustrated with how he taught, when I get frustrated with God, when I get frustrated with Christianity, when I get frustrated in particular with evangelical Christianity and I get upset and I just want to say, you know what, forget it all. The Holy Spirit will often bring back to mind, where else will we go, Lord? You have the words of life. Well, maybe you wake up in the morning and you just don't think you can face today. And so the Holy Spirit brings back to mind, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or maybe, maybe on a day when everything is going wrong and you just can't see a way forward, God brings back to mind, the Holy Spirit brings back to mind that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Or maybe, like me, you put it on your arm, and so in the days where it feels like evil is winning, and it feels like the wicked prosper, as the psalmist said, you remember that Jesus didn't promise that it was going to be easy. And you remember, I want to know Christ the power of his resurrection to share in his suffering and be like him in his death. You see, the Holy Spirit can begin to bring these passages of Scripture back to mind. And maybe on a day when you just feel like you are not good enough and that you are just not worth it. The Holy Spirit brings back to mind, come my love, my beautiful one, and come with me. The winter is over and the spring has come. And you remember that you are beloved by God. You see, this is the power of memorizing scripture is that as it can bounce around in there, the Holy Spirit can bring it back at those times to encourage us when we need to. And it also allows the Holy Spirit then to show us the way forward. 
to lead us and guide us. And we're like, I don't know what I should do here. And the Holy Spirit can bring these passages of Scripture back to mind. Jesus told us that that's what the Holy Spirit would do. In the Gospel of John, in John 14, 26, Jesus says, the companion, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you. Jesus never promised us that following him would be easy. In fact, he promised us that following him would be difficult. It would be hard. He promised us that it was going to take discipline. That it was going to take work. That it, that it wasn't just going to be something that just sort of came naturally to us. And in fact, it's something that tends to come against our nature, against that brokenness that we're all fighting with. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to the disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And this is why we decided to do a series on the spiritual disciplines, because this is so important. I can't, I can't follow Jesus for you. Roy can't follow Jesus for you. The elders at church can't follow Jesus for you. You have to. And if you're expecting us to do it for you, that's probably not going to happen because, because i, I got to be honest, we're barely, barely handling it ourselves. But the beautiful reality uh, of the fact that God came here in the person of Jesus, that he died on the cross for our sins, that the fact that he did that on our behalf means that you and I can actually go to him ourselves. It means that the Holy Spirit wants to come to each one of us to help us, to lead us, to guide us, to teach us. And so I want to encourage you. Get your Bible phone, or maybe, maybe even, if you really want to be crazy, get like an old school paper, I think they call them books, and you can like turn the pages. Start reading Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, Acts. Start there. Start seeing what God wants to say to you, what God is asking you to do, how God is asking you to live. Taste and see that the Lord is good, that Jesus makes sense. That Jesus is who he said he was and did what he said he did. Not so we can earn points with God. Not so we get God miles. Not so you can win a precious moments Bible too. Not for that. But because that's how we can learn to live life. Because this life that Jesus promised us is an eternal one. But it starts now. And we can learn how to live it now. And we can actually begin to get the benefits of it now, Jesus said, John chapter 10, starting verse 7, he said, I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who come be came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy I came so that they could have life, indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. Give it a try. You won't regret it. Let's pray.